I feel very honored to be here. I was born in Wuhan, the central part of China. That was me. I was five years old. I lived through the Chinese Cultural Revolution. The book is a fictionized, but 80% of the story is based on my life. So I'm just going to read you a few short passages so you get a little glance about my life, my journey from east to west. The summer of 1972, before I turned nine, danger began locking on doors all over China. My parents worked as a doctor in city hospital number four. It was the best hospital in Wuhan, a big city in central China. My father was a surgeon. My mother, a traditional doctor of Chinese medicine, treated patients with herbs and acupuncture needles. When my dog got sick, I treated her with candies. This is all true. So, like I said, 85% story is based on my life. We lived in a three-story brick building in the hospital compound near the Yangtze River, the longest river in China. So our apartment is the number one on the second, on the second floor. It used to be a missionary um, hospital. My father was trained by a Western missioner. So that's why during the Cultural Revolution, he was accused as an American spy. So he was put in jail. And he was my hero. I'm very close to my father. When you read my book, you can see um, I have a kind of a difficult relationship with my mother. So my father was very dear to me. When he died of cancer, that's when I feel really lost. I feel like I lost touch with China, lost touch with my root. And I always thought I was a very upbeat person. That's the first time I feel like I was very depressed. So that's what inspired me to write this book. It was a very difficult book to write. Many times I have to stop because the memory was very painful. At that time, I was a pretty uh, established children's book writer. This is like a new genre for me to branch in, and uh, I am writing my second language. I struggle even today. There's days I wonder what I'm doing and uh, writing in my second language. I could have had a different career, but I really enjoy it. I cannot imagine what else would have helped me to get in through that grief period. And this is one of the forbidden books I smuggled out of uh, China when I left China. During the Cultural Revolution, we are forced to read all the propaganda books. <coughs> and I have two secret books, survived the Red God search. And uh, so what that, at the time for me to tell who is my best friend is who were willing to trade that secret book with me. In this book, this is just old English textbook. And I remember very clearly there's a two short stories in that. One is about Pompeii. Another one is uh, Perman, Egypt. I asked my father uh, at a very difficult time when there's no food and no electricity, I said, I wish one day I can go there. And my father looked at me, he said, I'm sure you can, dear. But at the time, just seems it's such a distant dream. We're not even allowed to leave our city. Very soon, the um, government sent the political officer lived, moved into our home, lived in my father's study. So we were spied day and night. I want to just read you a very short passage here. And this is after the revolution. We finally have enough money to buy a radio because during the revolution, the Red God came, they destroyed the old radio we have. They want to enjoy freedom, Father whispered. What's freedom? I whispered back. Father led me to my bedroom. Freedom is being able to read what you want and to say what you think. I saw sadness in his eyes. I want to ask him if people disappear in America, but I didn't. Talking about Dr. Wang made father unhappy. So Dr. Wang was my father's best friend and also educated by the missionary, Dr. Uh, Smith. And he was our neighbor upstairs. And one day he just disappeared. And uh, for many, through few years, and every morning I get up, I have this fear. We just don't know which our neighbor will be disappeared. My biggest nightmare is my father will be gone. And after the revolution, my father is the one on the left. He became the director of the surgical department in the hospital. He went to the United States. He really missed his patient. He insisted he went back <coughs> to China. And then he had a lung cancer. He passed away in the hospital. He practiced most of his life. And for a long time, I do not understand him, why he wants to go back to China, why he did not want to stay in the state. Until a uh, much later, when I finished my book, I went back to China, I saw the people live around the hospital, because the hospital is located in a very poor part of the city. 
And he helped many, many poor people. He just feel very compassionate, passionate about his patient. This is a long alleyway. Every day I have to walk down this long alleyway to go to school. Um, you know, in the midst of the story, I talk about my father was arrested. He was sent to the, the, the city jail for being, uh, because he spoke against the government. So they kept him in the city jail. The interesting thing is because they only trust my father to perform on them, the Communist Party leader. So they didn't send my father to neighbor camp like many doctors. They kept him nearby. And later on, we find out. So whenever they need surgery performed, they would take my father out of jail to perform the surgery, then put him back. Later on, when I find out, I feel very resentful. I said, how could you treat those people? Their children are the one pick on me at the school. They're the one waiting at the end of this long alleyway. Every day when they go to school, they would attack me. And my father said, he said, I'm a doctor. Whoever lying on my surgical bed, they are my patient. I have to treat them with compassion. And that's truly what he did. I really respect that. So this is what I have to go through. Every day when I go to school, um, I'm ready to fight because I never know who's going to attack me on the other side. This is my school. My classroom was the first one on the first floor. The vendor on the street, this is what I show you. The, uh, the hospital is located in a very poor part of the city in 06. Like their life has not changed much, just as I remembered. And this is a vendor with sell steam bun on the street. Every morning, my mother gave me five cents. I would buy a steam bun and walk to school. As you can tell, food is a very, very important to me. And um, I think about the food all the time. I always tell people that's because I feel I never had enough to eat. In the story, in all my writing, and I use food as a metaphor to tell my story. And the writing. I worked on this for seven years. And when people say, what is that like? I said, well, this is the first thing I did every morning when I get up. Because at night, I dreamed about China, and I thought about my parents. And uh, so when I get in the morning, I work on the story. And uh, the last thing I did at night, I work on the book. The book has translated into many different languages. And uh, my sister was putting this together, and he said, you know, I ran out of space. I said, don't worry, I think the, this is good enough. And I still get an award, and it was awarded as a one book, one county in California. So the whole county was reading the book that summer. I, I can't even remember. I spoke to all those libraries. And this is at the UC Davis University. Now they use this as part of the curriculum and textbook. All the students read my book. It's my journey. I was started at nine years old. I was a very spoiled little girl. I didn't want to eat all the strange food my mother made for me. But as the time goes by, I have to go to fight for food to survive. After one instant at the market, I then to get hold of the goods I wanted before showing my ration ticket. A big year boy who was half a head taller than me offered to trade a small bag of peanuts for two of my egg ration tickets. I was so happy to see the prompt peanut. Without thinking, I took out my ration ticket inside my shoe. The boy grabbed them and ran. With one shoe in hand, I chased him for two long blocks. When I caught up with him, I grabbed him by the back of his collar. I screamed and yelled and hit him with my shoe until he gave me the bag of peanuts. That night, mother and I enjoyed peanut and the red day soup. My mother is a traditional Chinese doctor, just for you. With a smile on her face, mother told me the soup helps the blood circulation. I nodded and I pushed down the urge to tell her how getting the peanut had already made my blood run. <laughs> All summer, I often wondered what father would think if he saw me fighting and yelling at the market. This is the time my father was in jail and I have to help my mother to get food to survive. So when I visiting school, I get invited to all over the world to speak to the student. This is at a very poor school. Uh, when I was talking during my lecture, all the students was very quiet. They didn't say anything, ask questions. I was very unsure. I said, well, they must not like what I have to say. And the funny thing is, the minute I finished my presentation, they all just came surrounded me. The girls start touching my clothes, and uh, some girl even touched my hair. And uh, two girls asked me, said, what can we do to be like you? I was confused a little bit. I said, you mean you want to be a writer? She said, no, we want to be just like you, strong. And that was the best moment to be a writer. I feel like all seven years' hard work paid off. Dr. Wang, that's the doctor with the 
disappeared. He was sent to neighbor camp. His uh, wife did not survive. He survived. He was still practiced medicine in China. And when I received the first copy of my book, so I wrapped the book with many layers, different clothes, sent it to my brother first. And uh, my brother rode a bicycle and delivered the book to Dr. Wang. I just thought, you know, when I saw this picture, I just s s thought, you know, if my father's alive, and this is, he would be very proud. So China, what's China today like? I was in northern China. You still see Chairman Mao's statue. And uh, my son, after the, the book, and uh, we travel around China, this is at one of the farmer's home. They still have Chairman Mao's picture at the center place. I uh, really want to teach my son about China. And because in, the, in today's China, you talk to the younger generation, they don't even know about cultural revolution. The Chinese government don't want to talk about it. And I do not, I think people should remember, so the history will not repeat. So I took my son, we, uh, for a whole summer, we traveled, we followed Chairman Mao's long march path. This is on the, the climb that, Tall mountain. I was very glad I was in good shape because he's a cross-country runner and he walks so fast. So the Golden Gate Bridge is a very important symbol through the book. So after the book came out, I got a call from San Francisco Chronicle. They want to do a big feature story about me. And um, they said, where would you like your picture taken? Can we do it in your kitchen? I said, no, no, no. People take pictures of me cooking all the time. How about the Golden Gate Bridge? I have heard the story many times. Dr. Smith gave Father the picture, the Golden Gate Bridge picture, as a farewell present before going back to San Francisco. He had invited Father to go to work in a hospital near the Golden Gate Bridge, but the Father decided to stay to help build a new China. The bridge is like uh, my dream. As a little girl, I just keep thinking one day, if I can go near the Golden Gate Bridge, that must be a heavenly place. Despite all this, Father told us we should look for joy even during hard times. The night when the e electricity to our building was cut off and the Khmer Lee was not home, Father closed the window and lit a small candle. He taught me how to dance the two steps and the walls I was quick to mend. I asked Father to teach me the tango, but he said our living room was too small to practice. When father and mother used to tango at the parties, everyone had stopped to watch. Mother wore her long white silk dress. As she gracefully swung out her leg, I could see her shiny silver high heels. They can't keep people from dancing forever. Someday, I will teach you at the dance hall. Father made a graceful turn with one hand spread out and the other resting on his hip. I dreamed of wearing a red silk dress and dancing with a handsome young surgeon. So that was my dream. But uh, I figured it out. I don't want to dance with a young surgeon very early on because I dated a couple young surgeon work under my father and I realized they all have to work at the weekend. So I said, no, 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 that's not gonna work. I want to make sure I find someone can dance with me whenever I want to dance. So <laughs> now I didn't marry a surgeon. So that's the picture. We took over 100 photos and he keep asking me, are you happy with this? I said, no, no, no. He got him very nervous until this one. And that's what we used. And I'm just very happy. Th this dancing, it was in my red skirt in front of Golden Gate Bridge. Thank you, everyone.